say this courage, they say, they talk to me about my courage fairly frequently, and that's not right exactly. I, I just learned to be afraid of the right thing. And I really mean that. I mean, I saw an endless repetition in my clinical practice and in my own private life when my eyes were open, the consequences of not saying what was true. It's like whatever hell you might fall into by opening your mouth when you have something to say that isn't popular, it's nothing like the hell that you're going to envelop yourself in if you lose control of your own tongue and mind. And I, like I said, in my clinical practice, I never saw anyone get away with anything even once. And so all you have in a situation like that is what is the truth. Now, you know, of course, you only have your approximations to the truth, but that's better than nothing. And so you need to be afraid of the right thing. And you should be afraid of contaminating your soul with deceit. That's what you should be afraid of. That will definitely do you in. And I know exactly how. What happens is, you know, garbage in, garbage out. The old programmer saying goes. And so you'll fill your head with nonsense and no one will call you on it except you. But you can still that voice if you try hard enough. You just wait until you get in real trouble. You know, one day there'll come a point where you have to make a decision. And the decision is the difference between life and death, or worse, between someone else's life and death, or worse, between health and the suffering that's worse than death. And because you've compromised yourself to such a degree, you will not be able to rely on your judgment, and you will make the mistake you shouldn't make. And then you're done. And that will absolutely happen. So you tell mistruths voluntarily at your exceptional peril, and you avoid the unpleasant truths that you might have to delve into in all their messiness at your absolute peril and the peril of everyone around you. And so if you see that, you become afraid of that. That's hell. And hell is worse than death. So, and I mean that most sincerely. Reality is best conceived of as the totality of your experience, even if that includes things that you wouldn't normally consider you. But certainly it includes things like emotions and motivations and bodily sensations and all the things that aren't precisely rational. The existentialists would take that claim and push it a bit farther by saying, and this is analogous to something I already told you, that the degree to which that phenomenological field, your field of experience, is fractured and incoherent and paradoxical, that, that, that occurs in pre precise proportion to the, weak, to the weakening of the spirit within you that necessarily has to be strong in order to remain uncorrupted by the tragic conditions of existence. So along with the existentialist claim, which is that life is unbearable in, in, its, in its very nature, it's tragic and unbearable in its very nature, is the idea that that's made worse by your own set of inadequacies, inadequacies that you could repair, and worse, that to the degree that you are rife with inadequacies that you could repair, you're going to make the tragic situation that's integral to life worse. Again, not only for yourself, but also for other people. So out of existentialism also automatically arises a kind of moral necessity, which is that you can't just sit in isolation and be useless and resentful. That doesn't work. If you're useless and resentful and you refuse to address the things that you know you should address, you can't help but pathologize everything around you. And so, you're stuck with a moral duty. And the existentialists would, would say more than that. They would say that if you don't shoulder that existential burden, that existential moral burden, you will inevitably suffer for it. You cannot get out of it. You're stuck with it. So, existentialists are great believers in free will, in that you have choice. But the, the free will has parameters, right? There are still things that you can't get away with. And one of them is, you can't, you fundamentally can't get away with being immoral. The, the structure of existence is set up well, one, one of the things you might say, if you were thinking about it existentially, is immoral things are precisely those things that you can't get away with. That's why people have identified them as immoral, is that they will inevitably, the consequences of enacting them will inevitably be brought to bear on you.
or on the people you love for. They'll, it'll snap back in some way. You know, and, and I, I see this in psychotherapy very often too. People will engage in the same kind of behavior over and over. Well, there's a classic definition of insanity, which is insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome each time. And there's an element of self-deception in that. It's like people will run out a procedure that ends in tragedy and then they'll repeat that over and over and you can lay out for them the causal connection between their actions and their conceptions and the outcome and they'll listen but there's no change whatsoever in behavior and so then they run through the routine again and bang and what they're doing is immoral precisely because whenever they implement it it produces the kind of catastrophe they claim to want to avoid because, you know, relativists, modern relativists like to think of morality as something that's just arbitrary, like it's a cultural construction. You know, and society one thinks that A is bad and society two thinks that B is bad. And when you get right down to it, there's no commonality underneath all that. But the existentialists sort of undercut all that and they just say, well... What's immoral are those things that you could change, that you do, that result in outcomes that are catastrophic for you. That's it. That's what immoral is. And so that's universal, because it doesn't really matter what the details are. You know, like what you do that's immoral could be very much different than what you do. It might be temperamental. You know, we're each in our own playing field in a sense. But there's a commonality underneath that, which is, well, for example, you won't get away with deceiving yourself. You just can't. And the reason you can't is because you need a model of the world that's like the world. And if you try to live in a model of the world that isn't like the world, you'll just bump into the world. And so the, the deception brings with it its own punishment. And that's why it's immoral. There's other elements of existentialism that I think are extremely interesting. For example, the definition of truth in existentialism is, is different than the definition of truth that might be characteristic of objective materialism. So, Truths that are truths from the perspective of objective materialism are scientific truths and they're usually descriptive truths and so the, the truth claims of science go something like this I'll undertake a procedure which I'll tell you about and I'll observe the outcomes and then if you undertake that procedure and you observe the outcomes and the outcomes are the same you know and we'll do this maybe a hundred times just to be certain then we'll assume that that what that outcome is, is real. So, it's a definition of a procedure, that's, that's the experiment that elicits the outcome, and then the demonstration that the outcome is constant across observers.